one huge round of applause in this place. You may be seated. You may be seated. You know, today is an exciting day for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, as you look around, you might notice that you can actually see people in this place today. Come on, somebody. We, we had, yeah, we've had an, uh, an issue with our lighting where it's either too bright or too dim in the room. And so we've uh, kind of changed it up just a little bit. We're going to try this out. And if this doesn't work, we're going to try something else. Come on, somebody. Several of you all said, I'd love to take notes, but I can't see. Come on. So now you're going to have the opportunity to be able to see your notes as you write. Amen? Amen. Once again, I'm super excited for all of those that are going to get baptized today. In fact, I want to give you a heads up that uh, right after I'm done preaching, I'm going to dismiss those individuals who are getting baptized today. There's a table outside, a baptism table set up outside. You're going to head right over to that baptism table, and uh, they're going to give you a baptism shirt. You're going to get changed and then afterwards, when we dismiss everybody from service, we're all going to go out to the pool and we're going to celebrate. Amen? Amen. 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 Are y'all ready to get into the word today? Yes. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell him, are you ready? Yes. Are you really ready? Yes. Come on, come on. I want to welcome everyone joining us here in person as well as those that are joining us online as we dive into part two of a series we've been in called Let's Get After It. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I told you in the past that the greatest pastors are good coaches. Come on, somebody. I'm your coach. Many of us, you've been walking with the Lord for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And for whatever reason, you haven't quite cracked your Bible open. But as your coach, I'm here to tell you today, it's time to get after it. We got to get after it. We got to get into God's word. Amen. During this series, we're talking about how to study the Bible. And I told you last week that we're going to become better students of God's word. Keyword, students. Come on, somebody. Maybe you were here last week and I challenged everybody to bring a Bible today, a physical Bible, a print Bible. If you've got your print Bible, could you do me a favor and wave it in the air like you just don't care? Come on, we got more people this week than last week, okay? Now listen, give it up for all our Bible people. Now, if you don't have a physical Bible, it's okay, it's okay. Next week, it's going to be the last week of this series. I want to challenge everybody in here. I want everybody to have a printed Bible in this place. Here's the thing. As your pastor, I need you to hear my heart for just a minute. My prayer is that you would fall madly in love with God's word, that you would not be solely dependent on me to share the word with you, but that you would be able to divide, rightly divide the word on your own, that you would be in a position where you can find truth as it relates to your life in the word of God, not dependent on me, but independent of me. In fact, the Bible says this in John chapter 1, verse number 1. Here's what it says. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In fact, there is this inescapable, inseparable truth that God is connected to his Word. In fact, the Bible goes on to say in verse number 14, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. In other words, Jesus is the physical manifestation of the unseen God. Hmm. I'm going to go so far to make a bold statement and say this. You can't truly know God if you don't know his word. You can't truly know God if you don't know his word. You can know of God. You can know about God, but you can't personally know God if you don't know his word. And the only way for you to know his word is you got to get into his word. Amen. Amen. You got to get into it. If you do not learn to study the word. You will put yourself in a position where you will fall more in love with the messenger than you do the message. See, what ends up happening is so many Christians are completely dependent upon the man up front. So then the man up front falls and now they're like, oh, what am I going to do? I'm not going to survive. Your relationship with Jesus can't be dependent on me or anybody else. Don't fall in love with the messenger. Fall in love with the message. Maybe you would say, Pastor, 
I just need to hear God speak to me. That's what I need. I want to hear his, I want to hear his voice. I want to hear him speak to me. I would tell you the best thing for you to do is open up the Bible and read it out loud. That's God's voice speaking to you about your situation. Look at what the Bible says about the Bible, Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is alive and active. It's alive and active. In other words, God attempts to transform you through the words on the page. It's alive. It's active. God's word is alive because God's alive. We serve a living God. Amen? Here's one thing I'll tell you about Scripture. We don't read it for information. We read it for transformation. If you're just getting into the Word trying to get some information, you are completely missing the point. We don't read it for information. We read it because we want to be transformed from the inside out. Look at what the passage of Scripture goes on to say. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. Huh. Can, can I tell you why I personally love the Word of God? I love the Word of God because it gives me godly wisdom. I get wisdom from the Word of God. Matter of fact, I've told you in the past, some of us, we need to stop praying for more money. We need to stop praying for a job promotion. We need to stop praying for a spouse, and we need to start praying that God would give us more wisdom. Because if I got God, look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 2, 6. Look at what it says. For the Lord grants wisdom from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. If I've got godly wisdom, then it doesn't matter what room I go in. It, it doesn't matter how many degrees the people in the room have. It doesn't matter at the end of the day I got godly wisdom on my side. If I got godly wisdom, I wrote them down. I don't want to forget them. If I got godly wisdom, I don't have to fake it till I make it. Yeah. Come on, somebody, like, that's the wisdom of the world. Yeah. Just fake it until you make it. If I got godly wisdom on my side, I've got favor working on my behalf. Yeah. I don't need to fake it until I yeah. make it. Yeah. Huh. If I've got godly wisdom on my side, I'm going to run circles around the next person because I got a different operating system. I've got a different operating system. Yes. Huh. Attaining wisdom of God begins with you knowing his word. Yes. It begins with you reading his word. In fact, it can't get in you if you don't get in it. So with that, I've told you that with this series, I want to be super practical. Like, it's one thing for me to tell you to get into God's word. It's another thing for me to tell you how. So what I did starting last week, if you missed that message, I want you to go back on YouTube and watch that message again. Starting last week, what I did was I began to give you five tips that are going to help you to study God's word. We've got to become students of his word. Key word, students. And so I gave you five things that are going to help you to study his word. Here, here they are. The first three, we dealt with them last week. Here, here they are. Here they are. Here they are. Number one, I told you, you got to choose a translation that you understand. If you can't understand what you're reading, then what good is it to you? Number two, I told you, you got to choose a time, a place, and have a plan to study. If you plan or fail to plan, you plan to fail. You got to have a plan to get into God's word. And last but not least, you got to pay close attention to the context. If you don't understand the context, it's impossible for you to understand what the author was trying to communicate. We went over all three of those last week. And then this week, I told you that we were going to tackle the last two. But I lied. We're going to tackle one today because this one is so weighty. You got to get this. And so I'm going to spend the rest of the day driving this one home. And then next week, we're going to drive the next one home. Here's the one we're going to drive home today. Here it is. Read slowly and seek understanding. Today, we're going to spend all of our time talking about what it means to read slowly and seek understanding. And then next week, we're going to learn how to pray for God to speak to us and apply what it is he shows us. The Bible says we're not going to just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. How do we actually apply what God shows us? Okay, so today we're going to spend all of our time learning how to read slowly and seek understanding. Standing, write that down. I'm going to read slowly and I'm going to seek understanding. Question, how many of you all would say that you're a fast reader? You read fast. 
Nobody? Come on, come on, be proud of it. I'm proud of it. I read fast. Okay, now put your hands down. So I'm imagining that the rest of you are a little bit like me. Now, you're not slow, but you read slow. You're not slow, but you read slow. Come on, anybody like me? Anybody like me? Anybody like me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, baby, I'm not in this by myself. We, listen, we got this running joke in our house. My wife can read a whole book in the amount of time it takes me to read two or three chapters, okay? But what she doesn't understand that most of us in this room understand is that I read for understanding. Come on, somebody. I read for clarity. I'm reading a leadership book. I'm trying to get that leadership book in me. Come on, somebody. She doesn't understand that. She doesn't understand. I'll tell her oftentimes, babe, it's not a race. And when it comes to the word of God, the same is true. It's not a race. You got to learn to read slowly. We're reading not for information. We're reading for transformation. Huh. Many of us have been walking with the Lord many years already. By the time the Lord calls you home, you will have walked with the Lord for 30, 40, 50 years. You've got plenty of time. Read slowly. Seek understanding. You don't have to be in a rush. This is not a race. In fact, if it were a race, slow and steady wins this race. Slow and steady wins this race. In fact, the same is true with many other areas of your life. I mean, think about it. We look at millionaires. Very seldom do you find a millionaire that was an overnight success. Most of them became millionaires slow and steady. Great marriages are not produced overnight. Great marriages take time, slow and steady. When it comes to uh, uh, your family, if you want to have a great family, a great family isn't produced overnight. It takes time, slow and steady. If you want to build a great business, it's not, you're not, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. Slow and steady wins the race. Have you ever noticed that in Scripture you'll never find where Jesus ever hurried? Like there's never a time where you see in Scripture where Jesus is like, all right, listen, I got about 30 more minutes, okay? Can y'all hurry this thing up? Like you'll never find that in Scripture. Jesus was never in a hurry. Yet we live in a society where we are constantly in a rush. We got to learn how to slow down. Slow and steady wins the race. Here's one thing we know about transformation. Transformation usually doesn't happen in a hurry. People will come into faith in Jesus. They'll give them like one month. And then when nothing in their life has changed, they're like, <laughs> I'm done. You didn't even give it time to work. Slow and steady. It takes time. I've been walking with the Lord for 20 years. I can honestly tell you that I didn't see huge improvements until at least five years in. Slow and steady. Here's, one, uh, here's what I want to do. I want to give you four things today that slowing down are going to help you accomplish in your time with the Lord. Four things that slowing down are going to help you to accomplish. Number one, it's going to help you to look for patterns. It's going to help you to look for patterns. Number two, it's going to help you uh, reference the text. Then it's going to help you to ask the question, what is God, what does this say about God? And last but not least, it's going to help you to ask the question, what is God trying to say to me? Patterns? Referencing the text, what does this say about God, and what is God trying to say to me? Let's look at the first one. Let's look at the first one. Whenever I'm in the text, I am looking for patterns. I'm looking for patterns. Remember I told you last week, we never build our theology on one passage of Scripture. We're looking for patterns. By the way, let me just say this. There's a difference between what the Bible mentions and what the Bible affirms. There's a difference between what it mentions and what it affirms. Yes, today we're going to go a little academic. This is going to feel a little bit like you're back in school. Look at your neighbor. Tell him, neighbor, I know you weren't the best student. 
but I need you to pay attention. Not attention. I need you to pay attention. There's a difference between what the Bible mentions and what it affirms. The Bible mentions slavery. It does not affirm slavery. The Bible mentions polygamy. It does, I was at a family gathering recently, and a, a family member made the comment when referring to polygamy. He says, yeah, that's biblical. That's biblical. Yes, the Bible mentions polygamy, but everybody who was in a polygamous relationship, their life ended up destroyed. The Bible mentions it. It doesn't affirm it. The Bible also mentions incest. It doesn't infer, uh, affirm it. It would be crazy for you to say, yeah, incest is biblical. <laughs> yeah, it mentions it, but it does not affirm it. Do you get the difference there? So when I'm spending time in scripture, I'm looking for patterns. Let me tell you why I'm looking for patterns. Look at this passage of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 34. It says this, women should remain silent in the church. They are not allowed to speak. But they must be in submission, as the law says. Look at what it goes on to say. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home. For it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Ladies, some of y'all are upset right now. <laughs> some of y'all are mad right now. If I was sloppy in how I approached the text, then I would point this out and I would say, ladies, <laughs> It's clear. When you walk in the, in, into this house and you cross that, that, that threshold, you need to close your mouth. And then you can open it back up again when you walk out the door. But we're students of the word of God. Come on, y'all. We study the word of God. And when you study the word of God, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, do I see a pattern? No. There's no pattern in scripture that says that anytime women walk into a corporate gathering, they should be quiet. That, that, there's no pattern of that in scripture. It's only mentioned one time in all of scripture. So it would be crazy for me to build an entire theology around one passage of scripture. Is there a pattern? Now, after I've established that there is no pattern, the next thing I have to do is I've got to go seek context. Remember last week we talked about context. Okay, so when I look at the context of this, you can look in commentaries. You can look in what are called concordances. Here's what you'll find. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. These are ex-Jews trying to follow Jesus. In Jewish tradition, men and women, when they were in a synagogue, had to sit on opposite sides of the auditorium. Why? Because it was a patriarchal society. In other words, it was a society by men for men. Men had to sit on one side, women had to sit on the other side. Men at the time were able to ask the presenter, the, presenter, the communicator, the pastor, the rabbi, they were able to ask questions during the service. It would be like if you wanted to ask me a question, you could just raise your hand and I would stop preaching. That will never happen. So do not raise your hand in here, okay? I will ignore you. But back then, if, if the man wanted to ask a question, he could raise his hand, he'd get called on, and he would ask the question. But women could not ask the question. So what did women have to do? They had to yell across the auditorium to their husband and ask the husband to ask the question. Could you imagine how chaotic that was? So what is Paul doing? Paul is talking to that particular church about a particular situation that's happening in that particular church that is stopping the presence of God from moving in the place. Are you with me on that? We don't build our life on one passage of scripture. We build our life on the totality. Where's my Bible at? It's in my book bag. Could you get it? We build our life on the totality of the word of God. Are you with me in that? So I'm looking for patterns. The first thing I'm looking for is patterns. The second thing, it helps me to do slowing down. Thank you. This Bible. We, we build our life on the whole Bible, not one text. Are you with me? The second thing that slowing down helps me to do is it helps me to cross-reference the text. It helps me to cross-reference the text. If you remember, last week, I talked to you about cross-referencing varying translations. So I gave you four translations. I told you, you have the New Living Translation. You got the NIV, the New International Version. You got the NIV. 
KJV, the New King James Version. I gave you the Message Bible, but I told you there was another 900 translations. You pick the one that works best for you, okay? Whenever I'm reading a text, I'm not just going to read that text in one translation. I'm going to look at multiple translations so that I can get an accurate understanding of what's being said. That's one way to cross-reference. But here's the second way to cross-reference. Look at this passage of text. We're going to use this as an example. John chapter 1, verse number 29. This is what it says. Then next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, if I'm reading that, I might say to myself, Dang, John the Baptist just called Jesus a lamb. <laughs> and just keep moving. But if I do that, then I can't accurately understand what's being said. So here's what I do. There is a website called BibleHub.com. Write that down. BibleHub.com. BibleHub.com will pop up. And I type in the passage of Scripture, John chapter 1, verse number 29. What it's going to do is it's going to give me that passage of Scripture in multiple translations. So, no, go back, go back. It's going to give me that passage of Scripture in multiple translations. So, remember I just told you, not only am I cross-referencing what different versions of the text have to say, but then there's another button I can click to take this thing to a whole other level. At the top of the page is a button that says cross-reference. Everybody see that? If I click that button that says cross-reference, here's what pops up. It's going to give me other passages of Scripture that are similar to the one that I just read. Remember, I said, what are we looking for? We're looking for patterns. patterns. So let's look at some of the patterns we see here, okay? So in Genesis 2, 27, remember, Jesus called him the Lamb of, the Lamb of God, okay? Genesis 22, verse 7, then Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, here I am, my son, he replied. The fire and the wood are here, said Isaac, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So here we see that lambs are oftentimes offered up to God as a sacrifice. Okay, why? Because in the Old Testament, you'll see where they would kill lambs with the purpose of sacrificing them for the sin of the people. So if you spent all year sinning, you would take a lamb to a priest. The priest would kill the lamb, and then God would forgive you of your whole year of sin. Then Jesus comes around, and Jesus says, I'm going to be the last lamb. So look at what happens here. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. She will give birth to a son who she married, will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. What does the word Jesus mean? It means the Lord's salvation. In other words, Jesus came to be the final lamb, the final lamb that would take the place for all of your sin. In other words, he became the payment for your sin. So going back to John 1:29. Here we have John the Baptist talking to Jesus. Here's what happens Put it up here, guys. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, here's the one who's going to take my place. Here's the one who's going to, his life is going to be payment for my sin. In fact, I don't have to offer any more lambs to God because he's going to be the final lamb. Look, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When I slow down, not only does it give me the opportunity to look for patterns, but it also gives me the opportunity to cross-reference. And when I cross-reference, I'm able to see things that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. Are you with me on that? Okay, so slowing down, I'm able to see patterns. Slowing down, I'm able to cross-reference the text. Let, uh, uh, here's the third one. When I slow down, I'm able to ask, what does this say about God? What does this say about God? When I'm reading the text, I'm not just reading to get through it. I'm asking myself, what does this say about the God I serve? In fact, my goal is to know him better, grow deeper in the relationship. I need to understand what is God's character? What's his nature? What is he like? What are his pet peeves? 
What is important to him? What's not important to him? It's no different than if you are in a marriage relationship. My wife and I, we've been married for 18 years. And every day, I'm trying to study this girl. <laughs> now, I don't always pass the test. But I study like crazy. Yeah, why? Because I'm trying to understand her character, her nature. In fact, when I truly understand who she is, you could come to me and tell me she says something. I'll be able to say, mm, no, that's not her. There's so many believers that are oftentimes led astray because you don't know the character of God. So when somebody comes to you and tells you this is the character of God, you're like, okay, I guess. The only way you actually know his character and his nature is you got to get in his word. Are you with me? Years ago, I had a friend who, uh, he's currently a believer, but at the time he was an atheist. And so here we are, we're having this debate. And he says, hey, listen, even if there is a God, he's too big for us to ever understand him. And I disagreed adamantly with him. Why? Because we can understand him and know him through his word. word. No, no, no. God loved us so much that he said, I'm going to give you the word so that you can understand who I am, what I'm like, what I, what I think is important, what I don't think is important. Are y'all with me on that? Okay, so let me give you an example of what that looks like. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse number 4. But when the kindness, everybody say kindness, and love of our God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things, the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. Thank you, baby, for looking out for me. It's a little hot up here. A little bit hot. A little hot. A little hot. Okay, we're looking for patterns. So we're not going to build our entire theology on one passage. We're looking for patterns. Look at the next passage of Scripture. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Everybody say kindness. kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. In other words, Jesus says... If you have me on the inside of you, these are attributes that you should exhibit. Well, the logical conclusion is God would never ask you to exhibit characteristics that he himself does not exhibit. So God is love. He is joy. He is peace. He is patience. He is kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all that stuff. Okay? But we don't build it on just two passages. Look at the next one. The next one says this in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. And God raised us up with Christ. And seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that, come on guys, keep up, keep up, keep up. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Everybody say grace. grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. From these three passages of scripture, I can logically conclude that our God is a God full of love, grace. And mercy. Question, where did you get that God was an angry, mad God? Where'd you get that from? Oh, well, it's in the Old Testament, don't we see God's wrath? Yes, we do see God's wrath. But we see that his grace, love, and mercy are far more relevant to us than his wrath. Are you with me on that? What is the text saying about our God? That's a question we've got to ask when we're spending time in the Word. Here's the last question that we got to ask. We got to ask ourselves, what is God saying to me? See, it's one thing to see what God is saying about himself. But we have to also understand what is God trying to say to me? So there's an acronym that we use to determine what God might be trying to say to us. It's SPEC. Write this down. S-P-E-C-K. Come on, y'all remember there's a passage of scripture that says, uh, why are you so worried about the speck in your brother's eye? How about you take the plank out of your own eye before you talk about the speck in his eye? Very angrily, just like that right there. Okay, so here's, here's how I would apply this acronym to my time with the Lord. First of all, S. Is there a sin to be avoided? As I'm reading the text, is there a sin to be avoided? Okay, let's just pretend for a moment. I'm spending time in the book of Jonah. And I see where God tells Jonah to go one way. And Jonah says what? I ain't going that way. 
I'm going the other way. Now he's living in disobedience. As I'm reading that text, I'm asking myself, not what is this a sin as it pertains to Jonah. I'm asking my, myself, God, is there some sin you're trying to highlight in my life? Is there some disobedience in my life that you're wanting to root out? Huh? God told you to start that business. You ain't start that business yet. God told you to walk away from that relationship. You ain't walk away from that relationship yet. God told you you needed to go fix that relationship. You ain't called the person yet. What is God giving you that you might be walking in disobedience in? Huh. Okay, so the first question I'm going to ask myself is, is there a sin to be avoided? Here's the next question I'm going to ask myself. Is there a promise to be claimed? P stands for promise. Is there a promise to be claimed? Okay, the Bible says... In Malachi chapter 3, when it comes to bringing the tithe into the storehouse, the Bible says, uh, God says, uh, test me in this. See, don't I open up the floodgates and pour out a blessing so big you won't even be able to contain it. Why do people in this house tithe? They tithe because they're standing on a promise. It's crazy. I don't understand. Why would you give 10% of your money to a church? That's crazy. Because they're standing on his promise. So as I'm reading the word, the question I'm asking myself is, is there a promise to be claimed? Here's the next thing. E stands for example. Is there an example to follow? Is there an example to follow? Okay, okay. Y'all remember, Jesus is about to be arrested by the Roman soldiers. Taken and marched before Pontius Pilate. The soldiers show up and they're about to put him in handcuffs. Peter gets upset, pulls out a sword, and he cuts off the ear of the Roman soldier. Jesus takes the ear, rebukes Peter, and he puts the ear back on. When he puts the ear back on, he turns around and allows himself to be arrested. What an example. The question that I have to ask myself is, why do I feel the need to always fight for me? Maybe, maybe that's you. you. All your life you had to fight. <laughs> I look for opportunities to throw that one in there. Maybe you're always in a place where you feel like you have to fight. And reading that text, you begin to say to yourself, if Jesus didn't have to fight, now he knew he was about to die. If he didn't fight back, why do I feel the need to always fight? Huh? Is there an example to follow. Okay, here's the C. Here's the C. Write it down. Is there a command to obey? Is there a command to obey? In the book of Ephesians, you see where Paul gives a command. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So maybe I'm reading that during my long time with the Lord and the Lord begins to convict me. Maybe you're not loving your wife the way you should be loving your wife, calm down. (laughs) Is there a command to obey? Maybe as I'm reading, I'm saying to myself, I haven't been obeying that one. Here's the last one, K. K stands for no. Is there something to know about God? Okay, so you remember before Jesus is set, to be put to death, he tells Peter, hey, listen, there's going to come a point where you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, nah, Jesus, I would never do that to you because I love you. That's that's how he would have said it. Because I love you. Jesus says, all right. Next thing you know, within 24 hours, Peter's like being asked by people, you know this man named Jesus? Jesus? Nah, I ain't never met Jesus. Mm -mm. No, I don't know nobody named Jesus. He denies him three times. Here's the thing that I can know about God. God still used Peter to change the world. Even after Peter did the thing that God told him, he was, Jesus told him he was going to do, God still chose to use him. What does that say about God? It says that God, even when I fall short and make a mistake, he'll still use me. Even when I do my own thing, 
Even when I make a mistake, even when I'm hard-headed, God says I'll still use you. Amen? Amen. We've got to learn to slow down and seek understanding. It's not a race. We're not just trying to get through the word as quickly as we possibly can. The question we're asking ourselves is, do I see a pattern? Can I potentially reference the text, cross-reference the text? Is there something to know about God? And last but not least, uh, come on, y'all help me out on the last one. Is there something to know about God, and is God trying to say something to me? Come on, I was, that was a test. Y'all got to pay attention. Wake up. Okay, as we close the day, there was something that I felt like God wanted me to share with you. He laid it in my heart while I was preparing, and I was like, okay, God. He said that many of us, when it comes to your relationship with him, you see him as a mystery. You see him as mysterious. But he said, I never intended for myself to be seen as a mystery. In fact, the thing that makes God a mystery is the fact that we don't spend enough attentional time trying to understand who he is. Trying to understand what he wants to do in our life. Trying to understand how he's trying to move. And many of us, God moves in our lives, but because we're not looking, we don't see him move. In fact, if I were to ask you, maybe many of you would tell me, man, I ain't seen God move in my life in years. Or maybe you just don't have the lens to see him move. God never wanted to be a mystery. Think about when it comes to your kids. When it comes to your kids, you would never want your kids to see you as mysterious. You would want your kids to know your character. You would want them to understand what's important to you. You would want them to understand why you love them. You would want them to understand. And the same is true when it comes to your God. He doesn't want to be a mystery. But the only way you take him from the mysterious to the known is you're going to have to spend intentional time reading his word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you've given it to us. God, you never intended for this to be a situation where we're walking around lost, confused, and clueless. No, 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 God, you intended for us to know you deeply. And so, God, we pray that you would help us to become more intentional. Help us to study your word. Help us to fall in love with your word. Help us to know you deeply through your word, Jesus. We thank you for it, Father. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. Maybe you're in here today and you would say, you know what? I've never actually met Jesus. I've heard about him. People have prayed for me, but I've never actually met him. I believe that in this place right now, today, Jesus wants to meet you right where you're at. In a moment, we're going to pray a prayer. And according to the word, uh, the word of God, all you have to do is pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, and you will be saved. That relationship that you so badly want with Jesus will begin from this day forward. If you're in here today and you would say, I need Jesus in my life. I can't do this thing without him. I want to abandon the wheel. I want him to take control. If that's you today, I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to simply raise your hands high. One, two, three. Jesus, come into my life. Change me. Shape me. Mold me. I need you, Father. Amen. Hold him up high. Amen. Amen. You can put your hands down. We're all going to pray this prayer, but if you raised your hand in this place today, I want you to pray it just a little bit louder than everybody else. Here we go. Everybody repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Make me a new person from the inside out. I believe that you died on the cross to save me of my sins. And it's because of that sacrifice 
that I will follow you for the rest of my days. I want to be a Christian, a true follower of yours. Help me to grow from this day forward. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Can we